I've posted over 200 videos this year, and seeing as how I've only got one or two left to go, I figure that now is a great time to look back at the tech that impressed me the most or perhaps left the biggest impression on me. And wow, there is a lot of stuff. I've highlighted what I guess is my top seven most interesting bits of tech that I've talked about this year. But before I even get into it, I would love to know what your top tech this year has been. Whether it's stuff that you've bought this year, just tried, or even just heard about. Let me know in the comments down below. Right, let's get into this. The first one is something that had arguably the biggest effect on the world this year, and that's ChatGPT, and large language models and AI in general, really. 2023 really was the year of AI. We had Bing Chat, Google's Bard, hell even Twitter's stupid one, is in beta right now. Every single press release that I got this year had AI somewhere in it, and both Intel and AMD are putting AI accelerators into their CPUs. It's a big deal, both as a product that we all now consume to some degree, but also as an ethical and societal dilemma. On the tech front, I'm really interested in how these large language models can take basically all of the text on the internet and turn it into a product that can output coherent sentences and even occasionally useful information. On the ethical front, I've personally learned quite a lot from things like ChatGBT, as we're now grappling with copyright issues, quality of work, and plenty more. Something that struck me from the Hollywood writer's strike is that they wanted assurances that movie execs wouldn't replace them with AI like ChatGPT or other large language models. But if there's one thing that's clear from actually using LLM's large language models, both cloud services like ChatGPT and self-hosted ones like Vicuna or Llama from Facebook, is that they are well, wholly unoriginal. They offer bland word soup most of the time, and certainly nothing production ready. Why would you want bland, uninterested script writing? I mean, cost, obviously, but the reason you hire the writers isn't to produce the first drivel that they can spurt out, which is kind of the equivalent of what AI at least currently produces anyway. It's because you want to create interesting and engaging content. That's what sells the, the movie or TV show, or at least that's what should sell the movie anyway. But before we get uh, you know, sort of stray too far into Miss Thorne's realm, which by the way, she has an amazing video on ethical AI that I can't recommend enough. I'll link it either in the description or in the cards or something. Uh, let's get back into tech. My next entry is this, the Steam Deck. This really is the handheld games console we've all been asking for. Of course, it has its cons, but it's such a complete package the, the whole gaming space welcomed it with open arms, and I, I can't help but use it as the benchmark when it comes to, you know, comparing to other handheld systems. Of course, I wish I had the new OLED version, which really remedies a lot of the limitations of this one, technically last year's model actually, uh, which is namely the display and the battery and a bit of the cooling as well. If you don't already have a Steam Deck, the OLED one is definitely the one to get now. But honestly, by far the biggest impact that the Steam Deck has had is on Linux gaming and Valve's insane work to get Linux to work for gaming. Ten years ago, Valve tried the same with Steam Deck, or Steam Machines rather, and failed miserably. But they took what they learned there and made SteamOS, a Linux-based operating system Arch, by the way, that actually works. It's a complete experience, plus has the full desktop experience if you want it. Proton in particular is such a big deal in paving the way for Linux gaming to even exist and for a more seamless experience like this. That's always the problem with moving off of Windows, especially for gaming. It's a chicken and egg problem, 
but Valve is finally providing the chicken. On the display side of things, the Steam Deck OLED isn't the only OLED on this list. The other spot is taken by the Evnia 8600 and the family of monitors that use that QD OLED ultra wide panel. The thing that has sort of struck me the most or more than anything with the Evnia is that it feels like a next gen panel. Like, the brightness is pretty good, more than enough for my needs anyway. It doesn't have a horrible adaptive brightness limiter, it has a bunch of protection features that don't get in your way, and even after several months of daily monitor usage, it's still completely burn-in free. After testing a few W OLED panels, including the AOC AG276QZD, which uses the same panel as basically all of the 27-inch 1440p 240Hz OLED monitors from people like Corsair and ASUS, the QD OLEDs seem just more next-gen. While all OLED monitors are still considerably expensive or more expensive than their LCD counterparts for the same sort of specs, if you can afford one, the Evnia 8600 and the monitors like it are arguably the best monitors you can buy right now. At least for my preferences and needs anyway, they, they offer the right balance of resolution and refresh rate, brightness and colours, protections, and being ultra wide is a nice touch. The only downside, and it's a big one, is the price. If budget is a problem though, Philips' sister company, AOC, has a monitor for you. That would be this, the AOC Q24 G28. This is the first 24-inch 1440p panel I've tested, and it's fantastic. Response times aren't quite as good as the OLED, obviously, but they are good enough, and the 165Hz refresh rate makes for a smooth and responsive experience. It's hard to get away from just how crisp this is, and if you are space limited, this is a fantastic upgrade to an existing 1080p 24-inch monitor. It's also an astonishingly good value, being one of the cheapest 1440p 165Hz IPS monitors on the market, even forgetting its unique size. A link to this and all of the other products and things and videos I'm talking about in the description if you're interested in splashing some Christmas cash. Sticking with PC tech, I want to talk about something that hasn't actually released yet, but I did cover a couple months ago, and that is Intel's Meteor Lake architecture. Meteor Lake is yet another seismic shift in how Intel makes CPUs. This is arguably bigger than their hybrid architecture shift with 12th gen older Lake chips, because they're finally going chiplet. Although technically, it is still a monolithic chip that gets mounted to the substrate. Basically, there is still a single big slab of silicon at the bottom that gets mounted to the green PCB bit, but that's just the interconnect chip. All of the logic is built on top, of that from modular tiles, namely the SOC tile, the IO tile, the compute tile, and the graphics tile. There are some major changes to the chip layout, including moving the video encoder onto the SOC tile that every chip has, meaning regardless of if the chip has integrated graphics or not, every Intel CPU will now have Intel QuickSync video encoding and decoding. The SOC tile also now contains a new type of core, the Low Power Island E core. This pair of cores acts as the entry point for processes and means that you can keep the whole compute tile asleep so long as you don't need any more performance. When you do, you wake it up, use the main E cores or even a P core or two to power through the task, and then the whole compute tile can go back to using zero power. Pretty fancy. There is a whole lot more to Meteor Lake, so if you want to know more, I'll leave the video in the cards for you to check out. But long story short, it's a really big shift for Intel, and will be coming first with mobile parts like laptops, and then the 15th gen desktop chips in late 2024. 
I'm really excited to get these in and put them through their paces. There is one other somewhat emerging tech solution that I want to mention, and that is Matter. Matter is, I think anyway, the smart home slash internet of things standard that we've been looking for. It isn't like Zigbee, as Matter is just the application layer, the language that all the devices talk. That means that it can work on top of multiple radio protocols or multiple networks, those being Wi-Fi and Thread. I personally really don't like Wi-Fi smart devices. The fewer things that have access to the internet from inside my house, the better. But the fact that Matter works over both is great. With a sort of Zigbee to Matter hub, you can even have Zigbee devices controlled too, which should make things more cohesive. Matter is still in the early stages though, and a number of useful device types aren't yet supported. And even those that are fully supported aren't necessarily fully supported in things like Home Assistant, my smart home system of choice. Matter is open source, but much like Zigbee, which is also open source, that doesn't mean that just anyone can make a Matter device. You've got to spend a pretty penny, in fact, double that of a Zigbee device at around £30,000 per year just to get your foot in the door, so it will still be big companies making the devices, but it's better than Z-Wave, which is wholly proprietary. Something that isn't proprietary, though, is my final pick, the open source response time tool and open source latency testing tool. Naturally, I'm completely unbiased here, but these have to be the best bits of kit that I've built all year. <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, these tools have made a significant difference to both my work, I could not imagine doing monitor and laptop reviews without these now, and if I'm honest, my personal life. If you don't know me, I'm Andrew, and beyond being uh, an autistic weirdo with um, a special interest in tech, I'm pretty disabled. Uh, my eyes are literally falling apart, my back is pure pain, my joints hurt every single day, my lungs aren't great, uh, my heart has uh, started playing up too, and my stomach doesn't like existing. I kind of struggle to make a living, uh, but selling these tools has made a significant difference to that ability in my survivability, as it were. And knowing that they are a useful tool for people all around the world, from the largest companies in the world like Apple and Sony, to individual reviewers trying to make their frankly corrupt industry a little less broken, I'm so incredibly happy to have these things in the world. Thank you to all of you who have bought one, and if you or your favourite reviewers want one, I'm still taking orders over at osrtt.com. So there you have it, my top 7-ish most interesting bits of tech that I've looked at in 2023. Like I said, let me know what you think is the best bit of tech that you've tried or just in general in 2023, and while you're at it, let me know what you're looking forward to in 2024. Like I said, I'll leave links to all of the stuff that I talked about in the description, and I'll try and remember to put the videos for all of them in the cards as well if you want to keep watching. Otherwise, feel free to hit the subscribe button for more videos like this and plenty more in 2024, and of course, you can check out plenty of the other videos that will be on the end cards if you're interested. Otherwise, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, have a great Christmas and New Year's if I don't see you in between on the streams on Thursday nights, and yeah, I'll catch you guys soon. See ya!